thank you for joining in on YouTube. Obviously, we would much rather be here uh, in person with hundreds of people in the gym, but that's just not where we're at right now. But I'm excited to be joined in this room um, by some colleagues and members of our COVID-19 uh, task force. We do have all three of our principals here. We have Ms. Lewis, Mr. Harrison, and Mr. Holt. And then uh, we have Ms. Cunningham, who's been a big part of what we've been doing with AMI over the last quarter. We hope not to use her very much this year. Um, and then we have Dr. Thad Harden and Dr. John Mark Johnson, who are parents here at the school, and we're also on our COVID-19 task force. I'm going to get us started with a word of prayer, and then we'll get going. Dear Heavenly Father, um, we do thank you for this technology um, that we're able to use to end last year, but also for tonight, so that you can unite our family and we can talk about the upcoming school year. Um, Lord, we just pray a blessing over this time. We uh, thank you for the people who've put in hours and hours and hours of work to help come up with a plan and prepare for the school year. We thank you for these parents who are ready to send their kids back to school uh, amidst even some potential concern or fear, Lord, but we have faith in you, Lord. We come to you tonight knowing that you are a heavenly father and you will take care of us. And we are so thankful for that. Just like every challenge in life, you're always there. And we give you all the praise and glory for that. Be with us in this room tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Well, let me get started by just saying thank you. Uh, very, very thankful to our families who are ready to get this school year started. Uh, we're uh, right at a week away. You'll be going to, to bed seven nights from now, waking up, and we're going to get to see some smiling faces on this campus. Um, and we're going to be able to interact with students, and we're super excited about that. Um, as we go through tonight, if you've got questions, if something pops up with something I've said, you can email info at conwaychristianschool.net. Um, Ms. Cunningham's watching those. She'll be forwarding those to me, and then we'll be answering those questions um, that we can at the end of this time. I've got about 20 minutes probably of the presentation. I'm not going to keep you forever, but we do want to make sure that you've got all the information that you need uh, ready to start the school year. So let me start uh, just saying we're in this together. Uh, I know everybody's been using that timeline tagline, but it's the truth. I mean, we're in it um, as a community, over 300 families. Uh, around 500 students, our faculty and staff, we've got to do this together. And at this time, it's a, a time that we need friends. Uh, we need a community that we can count on to make the best of that situation. It's a big part of our plan is we feel like we have great people to work with. And so we're excited um, to see what this looks like working together. And we've uh, formulated for marketing, but also just a focus point this year is Christian safe and committed. So what does that mean? Well, obviously we haven't changed. We're a Christian school that's focused on Jesus Christ. Uh, we're focused on making sure our kids learn about the word of God every day. We don't want them to live in fear. We want them to be able to come to school and to be able to have an experience where they know that they have a heavenly father that created them specifically the way that they are and that loves them um, extraordinarily. Now we're safe. We've gone beyond uh, what most schools have been able to do. We've been very, very blessed through uh, some donors and through some efforts. We're going to talk about that, but we feel like we have a very safe campus um, that we're excited to bring kids and faculty onto and, and teach them. Um, as far as committed, to be honest with you, we're just committed to what we're going to do. We're committed to five days a week. We're committed to 178 days during the school year, and we want to see this through, and we're excited. And I can't wait to have our teachers back on campus tomorrow. It's going to be a time of just feeling the energy in the room, answering some questions, getting fired up, and I can't tell you, I, I can't tell you how excited our faculty and staff are going to be to welcome you back uh, next Wednesday, August the 5th. Let me give you some advice, and it's some advice that I gained from a pastor here in town. It was really important for me to get it when I got it, and I hope it's important. Touch on, touches on uh, six points, and the first one is, as we enter this year, we've got to stay focused on Jesus. And, and you know, it's, at times as Christians, it's kind of the Sunday school answer, but it's it can't be. It can't be for this year. We've got to be lasered focus on Jesus. We've got to depend on him. We've got to depend on our personal relationship that we have in Jesus Christ. And he's going to help us get through this. You're going to have some mornings where you might be a little jittery. You might have some fear or whatever it might be. But when we go to him and we pray, even I would encourage you as a family, uh, every morning before you leave, pray, um, spend time with him. The second thing is we got to stay positive and keep our passion for life. Look at what's going on, on around the world right now. A lot of people have lost their passion for life. Um, they're not being positive. Fear is ruling the day. We're not going to let that happen at Conway Christian. We don't want that for our kids. So I ask you, and I'm going to commit to it myself, we're going to stay positive and we're going to keep our passion for life as we go into this school year. The third thing is stay close to our community. We've got to do this together. Like I said at the beginning, we've got to rely on each other. Um, we've got an extended community and we need to make sure that we do this together. 
The fourth thing is to walk in forgiveness with one another. I can assure you that there'll be some times this year to where you're going to be frustrated about something. You're going to wonder why a decision was made that way. You're going to wonder why a policy was formulated this way or that way. And we might have some anger and some frustration, but I'm begging you and I'm asking you as we get into this, let's walk in forgiveness together because that's what Christians do. Point blank. That's what Christians do. And we need to offer forgiveness for one another as we get into this. The fifth thing is pray for each other daily. I'm begging you to pray for me to pray for our faculty and staff, and we're going to pray for you. And we can do this together as we pray for one another. I don't know about you personally, but when I'm, when I'm in prayer with the Lord, um, when our staff's in prayer with the Lord, it makes a huge difference. You can just see it in the hallways. I can feel it in my heart. Um, I know that you feel that same way as a Christian. So if you've been slacking, um, if you haven't had time to pray, I'm challenging myself. It's been a busy summer. There's been a lot of hours spent up here and I probably haven't prayed as much as I should, but I'm going to commit to it every day, every morning on my way to school and throughout the school day. You might not be able to tell because I'm going to have my mask on, but I'm going to be praying. And then the sixth thing is be thankful. Man, the world needs Christians that are thankful for the opportunities that we have. I mean, we've got an unbelievable opportunity. Our kids need love. They need encouragement. They need to learn. They need to laugh. Let's be thankful that we have the opportunity to do that five days a week for 178 days. Um They need the spiritual connection that schools and parents can help offer. They need the physical support. They need uh, emotional support right now with all the questions and uncertainty that's going on in the world. And they just need to laugh. They just need to have the opportunity where they can come and enjoy being around their friends. So we're we're super, super thankful and excited uh, for this opportunity. So just some advice. Again, I'm just passing on. I didn't come up with it, but um, just uh, something I want to pass on to our school community as we move forward. Okay, as we get ready, I'm going to cover a few things. And one of the things is COVID-19 has not ruled the day. We are still moving forward as a school. We've been concentrating on some things to help make us better as we get into the school year. Some of those things are uh, we we redid the uh, interior hallways and the commons of the upper school. Uh, Part of our plan with our capital campaign, which I'll hit here in a minute, part of that was changing this facility into fifth through eighth grade and really changing the look of it. And we've done that. It looks really cool. I think the kids are going to be excited to come back. It smells better. It looks better. Um, it's got a really good look to it. So that's one thing that we've done. Mr. Harrison's worked on new schedules for 7th to 12th graders. I know a lot of y'all got those and you're thinking, well, what is this? Um, but it's going to make sense quickly for our kids. It is going to give them the opportunity uh, to enhance their learning. There's a lot of different options that go on with that, a lot of flexibility that we think will keep the students engaged. Um, and uh, we're excited for that. That's called a flex mod. So if you've got any questions about that, he can answer that here later. And another big uh, point of it was it helped us create some smaller classes in the upper school. Um, so that helps us get with the social distancing there. Um, also, we have a commitment to uh, serve students with learning needs. Um, you know, a lot of kids have that. I mean, and we want to be able to provide the accommodations and modifications. So we're trying to reach out to our families. If that's something that you haven't been able to complete yet, we ask that you get uh, with Lisa Gray and your principals and make sure we've got that learning plan in place. Uh, Mentioning uh, Lisa Gray, she's our new curriculum coordinator for the lower school. We're super excited about her working with Mr. Holt and myself on teaching uh, teachers the latest in professional development, manipulatives, the different tools and strategies that they need uh, to continue growing and meet the needs of today's students. So those are some things that we've been working on. We're moving forward. I'm never going to let that train stop. We're never going to let it pause. We're never definitely not going to let it go backwards. So we want to keep moving forward, even though COVID has kind of distracted us a little bit. Uh, Next thing is our strategic plan. Uh, We worked on that last year. Some of you are part of that process, or actually all of you were because you were part of the big survey that we did, but some of you made up the strategic planning team. Thank those people again for their service. Thank you for filling out the survey. We got a lot of really good information. One of those was actually the curriculum coordinator idea, but we still haven't been able to do that with the teachers. We're going to go through that plan and the recommendations uh, in the covid made school go to AMI. We had to focus on that. So this fall, we'll go back and we will meet with the teachers. We'll finish that plan. I'll get that out to all the families uh, sometime this fall or winter, because as you know, strategic plans are the driving point behind any successful organization. It helps you keep laser focus on where you're going. And we want to make sure that we always have an active strategic plan. The next thing and a big part of what we talked about last year was an exciting announcement that we had at the beginning of last school year, where we had $2.5 million dollars Uh, donated as a matching gift to our school. Um, We had a lot of positive responses that we had hundreds of thousands of dollars that were given to that campaign, but safety came first and we had to push the pause button. And as of right now, that campaign is in hold, but we are going to get back to it. We still have those needs in academics, arts and athletics. The anonymous donor is still committed to giving us the $2.5 million if we can raise it. The donors who have given the money are still committed 
and we want to come back to that. But COVID is our priority this school year. Getting it started on the right foot is our priority. But we will come back to um, campaign 2020 and we'll let you know when um, uh, that will take place here later on the school year. OK, the last couple of things before we get going um, with the COVID plan is we want you to get involved this school year and we want you to stay in touch. So some ways that you can get involved. The first is our, our parent teacher fellowship. We love to have uh, ladies and occasionally some men uh, join that parent teacher fellowship. They help support our teachers. They help uh, provide different uh, activities here at the school to help raise money. A lot of the projects that have gone on over the last several years have been done through PTF funds. We thank each and every one of those people who have uh, served on the PTF. If that's something that you would like to do, um, just let us know. There'll be some forms that go out. You can always just send something that info at Con conwaychristianschool.net and we can get you in touch with the appropriate PTF member. Our booster club uh, also, also does a lot of those things. They're focused on athletics. Uh, a major portion of what we do athletically comes from funding from the booster club. This year uh, obviously could be a little bit of a challenge um, with as we're still waiting to figure out what happens with the AAA and, and how we do athletics, but we're still going to have needs there. And we'd ask for you to, to get involved with that. You can reach out to coach Kramer and he can help get you plugged in. They would love additional help there in a, a variety of capacities. Our Eagle weekly uh, for those of you that are new to the school, that is the way that you get information. So every week you're going to get one, maybe two Eagle weeklies that usually comes out on a Tuesday or Wednesday. It's an email and we want to make sure that we communicate uh, broad school news through that and that we're able to uh, keep you in the loop. Communication is very important to me and my faculty and staff. And so just use Equal Weekly to do that. Then also social media. You can follow us on Facebook, on Twitter and on Instagram. Uh, we're going to post a bunch of cool things that are going on with your kids there. So feel, feel free to join us in that way. But please, please uh, get involved and stay in touch with us. OK, this year's um, theme. Every year we have a theme. Um, this year's theme is kind of going back old school. So our school, when it was founded almost 30 years ago now, next next school year will be 30 years. This is our 29th. Um, the school was founded on the verse from Isaiah 40, 31, and it talks about uh, soaring like eagles. And I'm going to spend some time here in just a second reading Isaiah 40, 28 through 31. But the reason we chose that going into this year was we want to soar above this. We want to soar above COVID. We want to soar above the challenges, but we can only do it with the Lord. And I love the words that are written in Isaiah 40, 28 through 31. Let me read it to us. Do you not know? And let me read it to you like Conway Christian. Conway Christian, do you not know? Have you not heard? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, does not become weary or tired. His understanding is inscrutable. I love that word, inscrutable. What does it mean? It's impossible to understand or to interrupt the Lord. He's inscrutable. He gives strength to the weary, and to him who lacks might, he increases power. That's me. Though youths grow weary and tired, and vigorous young men stumble badly, yet those who wait for the Lord will gain new strength. Amen. They will mount up like wings on eagles. They will run, and they will not get tired. They will walk, and they will not become weary. I can't think of a better prayer for this school year. I mean, we need that. I need that. I want to, I want to be able to run, but I'm going to need the strength that only comes from him. And that comes through being in his word. That comes through prayer. And that comes through community like we discussed a minute ago. You know, on that, you know, last week I shared with the teachers a little thing. Um, you can have a plan. And we feel like as you look, and we're talking about this in a minute, you look at CDC guidelines, you look at the American Association of Pediatrics guidelines uh, with the governor and the Department of Education has put out. We feel like we have a really sound plan, but, you know, the plan and assurance from the world is not going to give us what we want. It just won't. At the end of the day, we have to have faith. And that's what this is talking about here. We need his strength because we're going to get weary. There's going to be days where it's going to be a challenge, but with him, we can get through. And faith is what's gotten through, what has gotten so many people through so many circumstances in the history of our world. And um, this is not the best comparison, but it's a way that I feel like I can, um, express what I'm saying. I remember a um, long time ago now, but September 11th, and I'm sitting there watching on TV and all the chaos that's going on. And then you've got firefighters, and you've got policemen that have been trained. They've got the best plans. They've gone through all this practice and they're getting ready to run into a building. And all that stuff doesn't matter at that point. What they've got to have is courage and they've got to have faith. And that's what took place on September 11th. And, um, you know, again, not the same thing, but it's still a, a hectic time in our country and there's a lot of fear and anxiety. So our plan's great and worldly assurance is great and all that. But as Christians, we've got to have faith entering into this year. And I hope that this verse speaks to that and that you'll keep it close to your heart 
as we go into the 2020-21 school year. Um, one other thing I failed to mention as far as staying connected, and I do want to make sure I, I get this out because it's important, is we do have a new app um, that's coming. It should probably be here in the next week or two. We'll get that information out to you, but it's a great way to get connected. It's going to be a great way to get directly connected to your classroom teacher, your coach, any type of communication that you need. So just make sure that you uh, see that. It'll come through Eagle Weekly, and then you download that app on either an Apple or Android device. Okay, so we know there's an elephant in the room, and uh, it's public enemy number one, and it's this dude right over my shoulder. We're sick of seeing that, right? And I can't read that. It says boo, hiss and hit the road COVID-19. That's kind of the way I feel about it, but the dang thing's not going anywhere anytime soon, so we just got to be ready to challenge it. So we've put together a plan, and again, um, this plan has got a lot of components to it. It's on our website. It's easy to navigate and read. I'm just going to ask you to make sure you've read it thoroughly to understand what we're going to be doing on campus. Um, and again, if you have any questions after you read it, even after tonight, feel free to email me or any of our principals. Okay, so as we go through this, I'm just going to kind of take this one by one. I'm going to do it in a format of frequently asked questions. Um, a lot of schools are using this format. I think it's a good format. Um, we, you do need the detail that's in the plan, but to go through a time like this, I think it'll be better if we just do these frequently asked questions. This is a point in time where you might have a question that you would, if you were here and you were in the gym, you might raise your hand and ask me to answer it. This is where you can use the info at conwaychristianschool.net to ask the questions, and we are monitor, monitoring those live, okay? All right, so the first thing that we have, the first question is, what guidelines did you use to formulate your plan and who is on the committees? So let me answer the second questions first. Uh, the committees were, they began with our leadership team along with the two doctors that are in the room with me tonight, Dr. Thad Harden and Dr. John Mark Johnson, um, just monitoring the situation, figuring out how things were unfolding as the summer went along and as we got ready for our uh, beginning of school day. And then what guidelines did we use? Well, there's a, a lot of them out there, but the most prevalent is uh, the CDC. Um, and then the AAP, which I mentioned before, and the AAP is the American Association of Pediatrics. That's done a lot of study on that. We've talked to other private schools that are like us, that are formulating plans. One thing I will point out, when all this started going down in March, the schools are really together. There's a lot of unknown. And so the public and private schools worked together as the governor was giving us direction and we ended up going to the AMI. I will say the camps are different coming into fall because the funding is different and the models are different. A lot of the things that we have to worry about versus what the public schools have to worry about are not the same things. And we're going to talk about that in detail here. But we're, we're going to approach this um, on our own with those input from those um, different sources. OK, and we do want to make sure that you understand that we're going to be flexible and this plan is fluid. Uh, we're going to keep you informed if anything changes. But as of today, going into next school year on August 5th, um, that is um, where we're at. Um, some things that are in our favor, if first is our size. I mean, working with 500 students is much different than working with 5,000 students. We don't bus students. We don't have massive lunchrooms and all those things that go into it. So we feel like our size at Conway Christian gives us a lot, a lot of um, opportunities um, to do this successfully. We'll talk a little bit about some of the other things on sanitation prevention in just a second. But another thing that we looked at is just the data, the data in our state, in our county, as it relates to COVID-19. I just want to give you data based on where we're at today. This is data today. So as of today, there's 1,081 confirmed cases that have happened since March in Faulkner County. In Faulkner County, uh, we have 137,000 people that live in Faulkner County. And since March, 1,081 of them have been diagnosed with COVID. That's 0 0.007. So not even 1% of our people in Faulkner County have been diagnosed with COVID. As of now, there's about 250 active cases of 137,000 people. As you know, that percentage is way less than even 0 0.007. So we like that percentage, especially when it comes to a per capita. Faulkner County has done really, really well with COVID-19. Um, in our state of Arkansas, as of today, there have been 40,000 cases since March out of 3 million people. That's 0.013% of the state's population that have been diagnosed with COVID. As of right now, as of today, there's about 6,000 active cases in Arkansas out of 3 million people. That's 0.002% of our population that actively have COVID. Those numbers where we wish they were lower, wish they wouldn't even hear at all, um, are in our favor. And we feel like um, because those numbers are in our favor, 
we're ready to do school. So those are some reasons that we how we formulated our plan, uh, who we looked to, and then how we made that decision and who was on it. Um, one key component I left out on who was on it was our, our board of trustees. So it went from the leadership team with our two doctors to the board of trustees with leadership influence and also the doctors. And so we feel like we had teacher perspective. We had ownership in the school perspective. We had parent perspective, all different kinds of perspective. And so that's where that came from. I do want to share with you a little bit of research that we uh, looked at and they come from the CDC guidelines and the AAP. So if you'll bear with me for about two or three minutes, it's worth me reading this to you. So the first one comes from CDC. This was out on July 23rd, 2020. So it's very recent. It's on the impact of COVID-19 on children. Here's what it says. Collecting and sharing data, including how it affects different places and populations, is important for understanding the context and burden of the COVID-19 pandemic. School officials should make decisions about school reopening based on available data, including levels of community transmission and their capacity to implement appropriate mitigation measures in schools. We just talked about the community transmission. Children appear to be at a low risk for contracting COVID-19 compared to adults. While some children have been sick with COVID-19, adults make up nearly 95% of the reported cases. Early reports suggest children are less likely to get COVID-19 than adults. And when they do get COVID-19, they regularly have a less serious illness. As of July 21st, that was seven days ago, 6.6% of reported COVID-19 cases and less than 0.1% of COVID-19 related deaths are among children and adolescents less than 18 years of age in the United States. Next thing I wanna share with you is early reports. This is again from the CDC. Early reports suggest the number of COVID-19 cases among children may vary by age and other factors. Adolescents aged 10 to 17 may be more likely to be infected with COVID than children younger than age 10, but adolescents do not appear to be at a higher risk of developing severe illnesses. That's all the way through 18 years of age. That's one of the reasons the governor made the mandate to have masks for people 10 years of age and older. Another thing from the uh, CDC is data on COVID-19 transmission among children is limited, but evidence from other countries suggests that the majority of children with COVID-19 were infected by a family member, not somebody at school. For example, the first pediatric patients in South Korea and Vietnam were most likely formed from contact with an adult family member. Published reports from contact tracing of students with COVID-19 in schools from France, Australia, and Ireland suggest that students are not as likely to transmit the virus to other students compared to household contacts transmitting it to them. All right, this goes um, on to what is known about how schools have reopened and the impact of COVID-19 transmission. This again from the CDC. In the summer 2020, Texas reported that there were 1,300 COVID-19 cases in child care centers. However, twice as many were resulted in staff members have been diagnosed as children. So out of the 1,300, twice as many were adults than kids, suggesting that children might be at a lower risk of getting COVID-19 than adults. And so as of right now, what we know is that there were dozens and dozens, nearly 60, I believe, of pre-Ks that were working during the COVID-19 all through the summer in Faulkner County. The last data I had was approximately five cases had been reported at those pre-K centers. Those are really good numbers and it's a sample that we want to look at because they're doing school um, throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. Also from uh, the CDC, it says it's important to consider community transmission risk as schools reopen. Evidence from schools internationally suggests that school reopenings are safe in communities with low COVID-19 transmission rates, similar to what we have in Faulkner County. A couple more things. Uh, from the American Association of Pediatrics. Policymakers should acknowledge that COVID-19 policies are intended to mitigate, not eliminate risk. No single action or set of actions will completely eliminate the risk of COVID-19 transmission, but the implementation of several coordinated interventions can greatly reduce that risk. And we're gonna talk about what we've done in just a minute to greatly reduce the risk. Last thing from the AAP, there's a conflict between optimal academic and so, this is important. I'm going to read it slow. So listen to what I'm saying here. There's a conflict between optimal academic and social emotional learning in schools and the strict adherence to current physical distance, distancing guidelines. For example, C recommends that schools space seating desks at least six feet apart when feasible. In many school settings, six feet between students is not feasible without limiting the number of students. Evidence suggests that spacing as close as three feet may approach the benefits of six feet of space 
particularly if students are wearing face coverings and are asymptomatic. So if you have a fever, if you're showing symptoms, obviously we don't want you at school. If you get a face covering, 5th through 12th graders will have those on. Um, schools should weigh the benefits of strict adherence to the six feet spacing rule between students with the potential downside if remote learning is the only alternative. So what we want to be able to do is here is assure that kids have between three feet and six feet of space. And then we can assure that they have as much space as possible in grades fourth and down below 10 years of age, then we'll remove the face coverings we need to. We're going to talk about that in a little bit. So again, guidelines to formulate the plan and some research. If you've got any questions on that, please feel free to info, uh, send it to info at conwaychristianschool.net. Okay, next question. Am I being asked as a parent to be diligent while away from school after hours and on weekends? Should we be extra cautious as the year begins? Let me be very emphatic on this point. Yes, yes, yes. Um, if you've been doing things over the summer, obviously we want you to enjoy your summer and your time away, but I'm asking you right now as we get a week away from school to be as cautious as you can be with the people that you're around. Uh, if you're around people, try to wear a face covering, even you know people that you've been used to hanging out with. We need to make sure that we can come to school with the least likelihood of having somebody with COVID come anywhere near our school, okay? So please start now um, and be very cautious as our school year goes. Don't get two or three weeks into it and then pull back, please be with us. Cause as I stated at the beginning, we need our community to make this be successful. The next question is what safety measures have been put in place regarding prevention and sanitization? I'm excited to say this is something that we've been able to do at a really high level. And again, thank you to donors. Thank you to our staff for working really hard to get this in place. But some of those things and they're highlighting the plan. Some of those things are, we were able to put UVC lights, that they have in hospitals and doctor offices in our HVA systems by the blowers. You're going to walk in that classroom. Kids are going to walk in that classroom. They're never going to see a blue light. They're never going to see the UVC light. It's uh, completely safe. It's in the HVAC system. When that kicks on, it's going to circulate through the air. It's going to help kill any viruses that are in the classroom from flu to strep, COVID, all those different things. Huge, huge thing there for us. We're going to have temperature screens for every student and staff that comes in our building. If a parent has to come in the building, um, then we will have to have them temperature screen with the mask on and also questions answered. Um, water bottle stations have all been changed. Uh, so our uh, water stations have all had the uh, faucet turned off and we'll just be using the water billing stations, water bottle stations that are located around campus. All of our toilets and our uh, faucets in the bathrooms have all gone to automated. So there's not any touching of any of that to flush or to get your water to come on and wash your hands. We have hand sanitizer stations spread all over campus so kids can access them at any time they need to. Um, we've got clean supplies that are approved by the CDC and others in the classrooms that the teachers will use, not the kids. But they will be regularly using those in the lower school when they go to recess, when they go to lunch, when they're out of the classrooms. The teachers will utilize that um, to clean the room um, in the upper school when they have passing periods and such. They'll be doing that from time to time as well. And then obviously our, our cleaning staff, Ms. Diana, Ms. Liana, um, are going to be working really hard throughout the day to keep our space as clean as possible. And then after school, disinfecting. Um, seating charts will be in place in case we have to do some social tracing. Um, that's going to be across the school from pre-K all the way through 12th grade. We're going to have seating charts, obviously a little harder to do in the pre-K. But once we get to kindergarten, those kids will be seated in the same spot. And we're going to maintain those uh all the way through the first nine weeks. So if we did have to use social tracing, we'll be ready. In the lower school, we'll be using family units or cohorts as they're being referred to. Um, those are in the plan. If you've got questions, let us know about that. But we feel like that's the best way to uh, let kids be involved in all the activities that they would normally do during the school year. But that way we can make sure that they're not as exposed to other people. Um, outdoor classrooms, we had our first one installed today. I'm super pumped about that. It's a 30 by 30 firework tent. Um, it's going to be great shade. We've got another one that we're working on to get in place. We're going to ask the teachers to get the kids out as much as they can to utilize those outdoor spaces. And then the last thing and when it comes to uh, prevention sanitization is obviously the face coverings that we're about to talk about. OK, um, but before we talk about that, what happens when a student, parent or faculty member gets a positive COVID-19 test? Well, let me make it really clear at the very beginning that the Department of Health regulates all of this. Now, we're fortunate that there's a school hotline that we can call um, and then we can get instruction for that. But they're going to be the ultimate voice on who needs a quarantine and for how long. One of the modifications they made over the summer is instead of this 14 day time frame, they've kind of knocked it down to a, a 10 day window. 
Uh, it has to do with, with when you got your test, how long you've not been symptomatic and things like that before you can return to work or in this case to school. <clears throat> um, if a class um, in the lower school were to get it and it were to take place during the school that the kid was symptomatic, we feel like there was spread in the classroom. The Department of Health could definitely ask us to shut that one class down. That's the reason we're keeping family units and cohorts um, together. So if we had to, say if it was one third grade class, that class would go AMI for a couple of weeks and they'd be able to come back and we just keep progressing and not have to uh, do any more than that. You might have a situation where somebody develops symptoms uh, uh, over the weekend or when they weren't away from school on one of our breaks. Then in that case, just that 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 family, that kid would have to uh, go into quarantine. But the main thing is we're going to get that guidance from the Department of Health and we'll be acting on that. Please also know that these are medical issues. There's HIPAA laws where we can't go out and say so-and-so has been diagnosed with COVID. Obviously, there will be communication um, by grade or by school um, as far as what we're having to do for those classes, but no specific information on specific students or families. OK. Next question. Um, why did the school stay with August 5th start date? Um, to be honest, this was one that we talked about a lot, but we were really just reassured the whole time with our start date. Um, if you go back, the reason that we set that up was back in November, December, and we wanted to do a fall break. And then we wanted to go ahead and get out a little bit earlier in the summer um, next year. So our last day of school is going to be May 21st. And then we've got a fall break on October 5th through the 9th. And as we looked at it and said, OK, we're going to have some uncertainty uh, coming into the school year. What we liked was that calendar gave us a lot of flexibility, specifically two weeks and one extra day. We have 179 days built into our school calendar. You only have to go 178. So we have one day that we intentionally left in there so we could be flexible with that. If we needed to adjust the fall break, we could based on what's going on in our community with COVID. And then also if we needed to extend the end of the year by one week to still stay before our traditional um finish before the end of Memorial Day, um, we could do that. So we do have a lot of flexibility in the calendar. And then we obviously love the numbers that we had right now in our community and felt like it was a good time to start versus the uncertainty. And there's a lot of predictions out there that the worst of it might come in October. We wanted to get a head start and get these kids back in school. Um, we can um, we can want to start on the same day as the public schools. Um, some people may be thought that, but we've got to remember the reason why the public schools decided to do this first is one, they didn't have the information that they needed for their AMI instruction is kind of what we're understanding. And then they don't have the supplies they need to get going. That was the reason the governor had them start on August 24th. Typically, um, if you go back about five years ago, that was their normal start date, but then there was a legislation passed that different districts could petition the Department of Ed to start earlier. Conway Public's done that the last few years. And so that's one of the reasons they've been starting about the same time we do. But the governor basically just took that away because of some of the needs that the public schools still had to get ready moving in this year. And then the last thing while we stuck with the August 5th date is it doesn't matter the day that we start. We're on our own, um, whether it's August 5th, August 24th, October 15th, November 1st. Whenever we start, we're on our own with our families with our faculty, staff, and with our kids. And so our kids have been out of school for almost five months. Um, we are ready to have them back on campus. I know so many of you are ready to have them back on campus. And so that was, that's the main reason, main reasons that we stuck with that August 5th start date. Um, next question, what plans does CC have for potential changes to the calendar schools are closed, AMI, et cetera? I just mentioned that, but one of the ways, I mentioned some of those, but one of the ways this could play out is Let's say we wanted to shut down for a week because we have a week to, to play with. We might not have to go AMI. We might just to say, you know what, we're going to shut down for a week and just enjoy your time with your family. And we'll come back the next week. Uh, uh, and I love that opportunity. I like the opportunity that if we need to, to push back at the end of the school year, we can do that, but still not get too far into your summertime. So those are some options um, and how it could affect our calendar if we go um, to, to AMI instruction. OK, um, next question. Will my student in fifth through 12th grade have to wear a face covering all day long when they're in their classroom? We're going to ask that those be on. That's going to be a big, big part of our plan. But we are going to work diligently. Mr. Harrison, I've been talking these outdoor spaces, other things. Um, we're going to make sure that they have opportunities to have those masks off from time to time. But I will say um, there is going to be a large portion of the day that they're going to have to have them on. Um, and we are providing um, the gators, buffs, whatever the terminology is now, that are some of the most breathable ones that we could find. Basically, just wear it around your neck. You pull it up. 
We're going to provide those at no cost to our families, one for all of our upper school students and fifth and sixth grade students. And so that's something that we'd ask for them to utilize. We feel like it's comfortable as possible, but we will get those down from time to time as the day goes on. I would rely on your grade level um, in the lower school uh, for fifth and sixth grade. And they're going to get, you'll get some communication from myself, Mr. Holt and some teachers about how they'll be taking advantage of some breaks some extended recesses, things like that throughout the school year. That'll help them um, be able to get some time with that, that face covering off. Should my student in kindergarten through fourth grade wear a face covering, even though they aren't required while social distancing in the classroom? And the direct answer is that's up to you. Um, if you want your student um, kindergarten through um, to have a face mask on, we will work with you to make sure that they keep that on as much as possible. Um, but when they're in their classroom, here's a way I've described it to the teachers. When they're in their classroom and they're at their desk and they're five, six feet apart, that's their, you remember the game you used to play where it was like you're, you're on, you're on base, so you're safe. That's going to be their base. When they're at their desk, they're on base, they're safe. They can have their, their face covering off. Um, if they get around the room, that's the reason we're asking even kindergarten through fourth grade to bring them. When they move around the room, uh, when they're moving around the buildings, when they're too close to each other, we're going to ask them to put those face coverings on. So desk is the base, and that's where they're safe. But anywhere else, they're going to be utilizing those face coverings as we move around um, and get too close to each other during the day, just as a uh, precaution. Okay. Any questions on any of that? Again, info at conwaychristianschool.net. Okay, um, I'm excited about this one. What will AMI look like this year if we have to use it for periods of time? Now, let me go back. I'm not excited about AMI at all. We don't want to utilize it. We want to be in school all 178 days. But if we do, uh, I think our upper school has got a really good handle on 7th through 12th grade, how they're going to use it with Google Classroom, the different things that kids use every day. Um, it'll be very, very similar to that, but I'm sure it'll be more personalized. On the lower school, it's going to be really more personalized. And what we've asked those teachers to prepare for is if we have to go to AMI uh, for a whole class, then what that would look like is you'd have groups of maybe three, maybe four kids that would work together. The teacher would set up Zoom times where she would come in and would meet with that small group. She would teach them lessons, answer questions that would take place a couple times a week. Later in the week on a Thursday or Friday, that teacher would uh, coordinate with you and the kids again to meet, make sure all the questions are answered, make sure all the assignments are ready. So we're going to be as personalized, as much customer service as possible. And I have strong faith and confidence that no school will do AMI as good as we have. I'm very proud of our faculty and staff for the way that we handled that last quarter um, of last year. But I think this year's model will be exceptional if we have to go to it. And uh, the, the personalized attention that you would get will be off the charts. Um, if you've got any questions about that, let me know, because I know that was uh, a lot of people's questions going in this year was what, what would that would look like if we did have to bounce back and forth between AMI and in-school learning. All right, this uh, we've got a couple more questions. What happens if the governor closes school again this year? Um, this is, like I said, last year was a little bit different. The virus was coming on us. Every school was, you know, basically had nine weeks left to go. We felt like we could close out um, going to AMI. Well, at the time, we thought maybe we'd go for a couple of weeks and then come back. As it evolved, we were out the whole nine weeks. This time, it's a little bit different, again, because we're a private school. Um, it will be up to our board of trustees um, to make the decision whether we go to AMI or whether we were to have something else happen. And so we will take the governor's recommendation. We will look at lo local uh, city leaders and what they recommend. But ultimately, it will come down to the Conway Christian Board of Trustees and those nine men and women uh, who help make decisions and policies and procedures to decide what our school does. Okay. Last question. And this is one that kind of gets in the weeds, but I know a lot of people have got questions about it. A uh, variety of top topics. Pick up, drop off, lunch, recess, activities. And then the schedule in the upper school. I'll give that one to Mr. Harrison here in a little while. Um, pick up. Um, it's going to look different, a lot different. And so we've got um, cones on the lower school side that will basically fit two cars, big cars, Suburbans. Um, and uh, those cars will release two at a time. So basically one family to the next family, um, whether it's me, Mr. Holt, Ms. Cox, Officer McKay, whoever's out there, as soon as the child gets out of the car, We'll check their temperature. If they read well, they'll have their face covering on. They'll go into class. They'll go straight to class. So anywhere between 745 and 815, that's when our, our tardy bell slash prayer will take place. Is at 815, you got 30 minutes. There won't be any gathering in the commons or anything like that. They'll go directly to their classrooms. Okay, um, on the upper school side, that'll look different. We're going to have, obviously, kids driving. That'll come in um, in the uh, commons area before 745. 
Uh, there'll be screenings that take place there. Face coverings will be on. After 745, everybody needs to be dropped off at the main entrance. There'll be temperature screenings there, face coverings on. Those students that get here after 745 will go directly to their class with backpacks on. Mr. Harrison will have some more information that will be coming out about that for those that have athletics and they have other bags. Um, where do those go? Where do those go? And um, how that works. Um, when we do the pickup in the afternoon, so that was drop off. When we do pickup in the afternoon, we will have cones outside of the lower school and each cone will have a grade on it. And they're about 12 feet to 15 feet apart. When the kids come out and typically they'd kind of run around and we'd have fun with them um, getting ready for them to get picked up. Now they're going to go and stand by their designated grade. So that way we can know where they're at and we can keep them from mingling with the other kids. We try to keep them from mingling during um, the school day. We'll have additional help out there. It will be slower, um, both the drop off and the pickup as we, begin the school year, but we hope we'll get proficient at it, but just be patient with us. We're going to make sure that your kid is safe coming and going the upper school side. There's a lot of different scenarios. I know one, Mr. Harrison is considered as maybe letting the, the drivers leave a few minutes early, few minutes early so they can take off. Um, obviously the carpool line um, will need your help as we're going to try to keep traffic off of German lane, get picked up and out as quickly um, as possible. Our lunch on the lower school side, uh, at least through Labor Day, we're just going to kind of see how it goes. But through Labor Day, the, the students will be eating lunch in their classroom. If you um, want to order through our lunch program, we will be providing that. It will be sent to their classrooms in enclosed boxes. Um, if you would like to bring lunch, you will still be able to do that. You won't be able to enter the building, but you can. We'll have places there in the foyer where you can get buzzed in, have the name on it, leave the bag enclosed there. Um, anything needs to be it needs to be wrapped up. It needs to be tight. It needs to be um, from a Chick-fil-A or somewhere that you've picked it up. And then also um, if you were to do bakery items, things like that for a birthday party, we'd ask that those be bought at a bakery and sealed. And again, you could come and you could drop it off. You could call Miss McKinney on the lower school side, let her know you're coming. We'll get those out of that space. We'll get those to the students. So um, in their classroom on the upper school side, uh, we've gone through and we've actually got the best case scenario. We've got seating for about 180 people but we're only going to put 57, 58 kids in there at a time. So you're going to have more than ample social distancing in the upper school lunchrooms. And we've adjusted those so that they'll just be seventh and eighth eating together, ninth and 10th, and then 11th and 12th. So uh, Mr. Harrison's really worked hard on making sure that works out well. And we're excited about letting the kids still come in there. They still have some conversation. They can eat, but they can be socially distanced. And again, we'll be providing the lunch over there. And then if you want to drop it off in the upper school, you can do that as well. Um, recess is a question. We're going to do recess, even if it's real hot. Um, so we'll have water breaks if we need it, but typically it's 95 and above with the humidity, but we're coming back in August and we want to get the kids outside. So, um, unless it's just record breaking heat, we're going to get them outside. We're going to let them enjoy having their face covering off and running around, having a good time. Some of those grades have lunch and recess close together. They can have extended amount of time outside. They can go eat lunch in the outdoor classrooms, um, as we get into the school year and they want to utilize that. Uh, so we've got a lot of different things going on um, with recess and lunch combos, but our kids are going to enjoy recess. And if we can find times to do more than just the normal, we're going to do more than just the normal. Um, like I said before, early on activities, um, they're going to be able to do all their normal activities um, in the lower school and the upper school. So they're not going to lose anything. Um, that's part of when I've talked about normal, wanting to make sure that we have a normal experience. Um, we didn't want to take away from any of those things that make Conway Christian who we are. So those kids are going to, be able to do anything and everything. They might just have to have their face covering on or socially distance. It might look a little bit different, but they're still going to get to experience it. And the last thing with the schedule I mentioned before, um, Mr. Harrison really worked hard. And we, we talked a lot about this flex mod schedule. A lot of progressive schools are using it. And I really, really, really am convinced that it's going to offer a unique experience for our students. It's going to break up the monotony of a normal school day. Every day is going to look a little different. It's going to give the teachers opportunity to do things different. And uh, there's going to be some independent learning times that go on. There'll be times when teachers are available for um, questions and answers where they typically wouldn't be. Um, it's going to be one of the more um, modern, um, cooler approaches to an upper school schedule that we have anywhere in the state of Arkansas, to be honest with you. So I'm very thankful for Mr. Harrison working on that and our upper school faculty and staff for their flexibility and excitement for where we're headed with that. Okay, last thing, and then we'll take questions. Um, the last four months have been a challenge. So there's no doubt about it. Um, really had to personally just 
persevere through it in prayer and um, a lot of questions. Um, Randy Lewis, our board chair is here. I've been calling him a lot. I've been calling Mr. Harrison, Mr. Holt, working it through. But the more I get through this and more I think about it, it's a way for us to draw closer to the Lord. And I, and I, you look over my shoulder here and you see the three uh, crosses. We all know what the three crosses represent. We all know what the big cross represents. And I want to personally draw closer to Jesus during this year. I want you to draw closer to Jesus this year. And I want our kids to draw closer to Jesus this year. I do not want our school to be one that would give in to the chaos of what's going on. I want to use extreme, extreme caution. But I want our kids to know that Jesus Christ loves them. And regardless of anything that the world throws at them, he is their rock, he is their refuge, and he is here. And I, and I just am so excited about joining with each and every one of y'all as we go in this year. And uh, we tackled this COVID-19 um, together and with uh, Jesus Christ leading the way. So I'm going to open this up for questions. Uh, Ms. Cunningham, have you had some that have come in? Okay, I'm gonna. She's gonna say it, and then I'll repeat it. All right. Um, all right. So let me find the first one. Um, lockers. Will third through sixth grade students be using lockers? Okay. The question is: Will third through sixth graders be using lockers? And the answer to that is yes. Um, and the reason why is because they'll be doing those in family units and cohorts. So when they go out to the locker, um, they will only be out there with their class. And so one class will go, the next class will come out, the next class will go. So we'll make sure we keep them socially distanced. And when they do go out to their lockers, they will use their face coverings. Will we have an opportunity to talk with our child's teacher, especially since this is her first year attending school before school starts? Yes, uh, open house is next Tuesday. Um, there's information on our website underneath back to school that has the time slots, it's by your last name. So you'll look and see what your last name is. You'll be able to come, you'll bring your supplies. You feel free to uh, do whatever you need to with the teacher there. I know our teachers are more than willing to set up a time where they could Zoom with you or call you um, beforehand. So if you, when those class lists go out on Sunday night and you get that, you can feel free to email up a teacher and try to set up a time before Wednesday um, to connect with them. But feel free to utilize that Tuesday during open house to ask them a few questions as well. What does drop off and pick up look like for parents who have students in both lower school and pre-K? Okay, so if you have lower school and pre-K, you will be on the lower school side. You'll go and you will park. Um, you'll need to make sure that your lower school student comes by me, Mr. Holt, whoever's out there checking the screenings to get their screening. You will go to the entrance to the lower school playground. There's a wrought iron gate there. You'll go through that gate and there'll be a check-in station right there where you'll sign your child in and you'll give them a hug and a kiss, and then we'll have an aide that will help walk them to the class. That way you don't have to enter the building. That's one thing I didn't hit on. It is in the plan, but um, having our parents on campus is a hallmark of who we are as a school. But out of extreme safety for you and for your extended family, we're not going to have that unless it's an emergency situation or you didn't have a meeting with the principal or a uh, teacher. Uh, though, like I said, there'll be screens there. But with this data that I talked about, if, if – um, we're most concerned about you. And so we want to make sure that we keep you safe. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, for those of us who have kids in the preschool, what would that look like if the schools closed down? Okay. Um, I can't give you a hundred percent answer on that. Um, we would probably fall into some similar discussion as we had last year. Um, Pre-Ks have been able to operate all through the summer. I think that's a question that we'd have to answer. Um, if the school was shut down, how do we operate the pre-K? Um, I can't give an indefinite uh, or definite answer on that right now, but like I've like we've done before and we'll always do, we will communicate well with you on that. And um, if you've got any feedback, as if we go to that time, please email me, email Miss Lewis, um, so that we can have a, kind of a pulse on what y'all are thinking. All right. Um, should we expect a tuition hike next year? with all the upgrades performed due to COVID? Absolutely not. So the uh, I'm assuming everybody can hear Ms. Cunningham. You should be able to. She's right by the computer. But if you can't, I'll let us know. I'll start repeating these. Um, absolutely not. The tuition has no bearing on these things. We've had uh, donor dollars, like I said, and then we've also had some money that we were able to pull um, out of some funding that we had going elsewhere. 
um, that we're able to utilize. Um, tuition is all always based on um, the board of trustees decision and usually goes directly towards teacher pay and benefits and operating the school on a day to day basis. Good question, though. But no, it will not affect that at all. As of now, will there be homecoming and winter formal? Homecoming and winter formal. I hope so. I really, really hope so. Um, we don't know if we're going to play football yet. We don't know if we're going to play volleyball. We don't know if we're going to be able to do any type of large gatherings. So I'm going to have to kick that can down the road and get back to you later. Um, if lower school students are on base at their desk and safe, why is upper school not safe at their desk? Because of the data showing that it's the state of Arkansas is asked that everybody that's 10 years and older wear a face covering when they're in public and stuff. And we, we, we value that. We feel like it's our best opportunity. Um, the data that shows that the teenage population is a little bit more likely to get it than the lower school population. Um, that's where that decision came from, but it's directly in line with, with the CDC, with the AAP and with the governor has been able to do. Now, there, there might be some classrooms to where, and Mr. Harrison and I can talk about this, there might be some classrooms where there's a very small amount of students in there, five, six, seven, eight. And if we can get them socially distanced, that might be an opportunity to, to do it. But we'll have to get into school and kind of see how that works. But I wouldn't I wouldn't count on that as we want to stick with the face coverings in the fifth through 12th. Um, what is the reason behind the new daily scheduling for upper school? And how will this impact missing certain classes a day each week. You want that one? Sure. Come on. I'm bringing in Mr. Harrison. Bring the light. All right. So the, the new FlexMod schedule, I think uh, Mr. Carson did a great job um, just a little bit ago, kind of going over with what the FlexMod is actually about, kind of some of the things it gives us the opportunity for. Um, the opportunity to, to change and, and to adjust each day is one of the reasons that we looked at it. But also, I mean, with, with COVID, we started looking at the potential of doing this this year. What's nice is right now I was able to get where we only have four classes that have more than 20 kids in any one specific class with 23 being our largest class size. So um, that being said, we were able to get most of our classes down into the low teens. So we were able to spread that out. Um, it gives us eight opportunities for classes. So we actually have, like if we had a traditional eight period day, max we would have about 42 to 45 minutes. That puts us at somewhere between 210 to 225 minutes a week of classes. Um, with this, it gives us eight opportunities throughout the week that you'll actually meet for each of those classes, which ends up adding up to 220 minutes per class. Um, so we're getting roughly the same amount of instructional time. The focus in FlexMod is with active learning. Um, so where you may have a class to where some kids are having the opportunity, the, the class have an opportunity to, to work on some classwork, to maybe read a part of a chapter before they do so. All that stuff has to be done ahead of time. So now with our um, with us having Google Classroom, our kids being used to looking at that, that's going to be something that our, our teachers may assign. Hey, watch this five minute video. We're going to discuss it. So now your active learning is a discussion. Um, we have opportunities for ILT. The thing I was asked last year is we want to either take eight classes or we want to have a study hall. Well, instead of having a structured study hall where you're tied to one spot where there's not other teachers available, ILT gives you the opportunity to either be able to use the library, to be able to get homework done, to be able to do research, to be able to make up quizzes and tests as needed. Um, and then you actually, we actually have um, teachers that will be available uh, during each ILT period. So if you need help from a math teacher, need help from an English teacher, Wow, that's pretty good graphics over my shoulder. Need help from uh, Miss Shelton writing a paper. The periods that she's available, you're able to go and get that done. Um, also, there's less classes per day. So as opposed to me having eight classes or seven classes and having to do eight or seven classes worth of homework, studying for multiple tests, now at max you're going to have five. Some kids even less than that if they play sports or they're, they're in, uh, say, art or choir where they may just be project-based. Um, so they are able to focus on less things and uh, be able to do – maybe um, a little bit higher quality work as opposed to trying to just cram as much in of seven different classes or eight different classes. Um, the last thing I think is that, it, and this is one of the things I think that will be um, in the long run will be something great for our kids. This truly gets us ready for that life after, especially 10th, 11th, and 12th graders is going to start working on social and responsibility things to get us ready for college. So, um, 
as you start looking and say, okay, well, I have a 25 minute ILT before my next class. I may need to look over my notes. I may need to study this. I may need to read over this chapter a little bit before I walk in and have a discussion or have a debate. So this gets your kids socially and respo uh, responsible for what they have going on. We're going to have to come alongside them and help guide them in that. So it's not something we expect them to know right off the bat. We're going to have to work with them and, and help them understand what is uh, the, their best use of time. But that's just part of our job is not only instruct them in, in um, the curriculum, but also instruct them in um, social and responsibility um, throughout their academic learning. So that's some of the other reasons we're looking at it. One other question that I know was asked, and I'll go ahead and hit this uh, lockers here at the high school for athletic bags. Um, we are gonna sign lockers. Each student will have a locker. We're just not gonna put all our stuff in the locker every day. If you have an athletic bag for um, senior high, junior high sports, seventh grade sports, we are gonna allow those students to drop those bags in the lockers. We're not gonna lock them up. They're gonna put their whole bag in there. That way we don't, we don't need cell phones and all that stuff in there. We're gonna put them in there so that way they can leave them, but we're not gonna congregate around the lockers each period in between each class period. Um, still trying to work out how we're gonna carry lunches, whether we're gonna carry them with them or potentially put them in their locker. I'll let you guys know a little bit more about that as we get closer to that time. So I know those were a couple other things. Also, if you're curious about parking, check your email today. Ms. Martin sent out our um, instructions for parking tags. Uh, that'll be next Tuesday. Um, and she gives a detail of what time each group can come do that. So I know that was a couple other questions that was asked. So I wanted to hit those while I was up there. Uh, question. Are there any restrictions on what students' masks can look like? And can they have sport teams or riding on them as long as they don't violate the non-uniform policy? Now, you want to hit that or you want me to? We'll see what I'm you say. <laughs> unless I'm overruled. I'll let you go first. Unless I'm overruled. No, I think as long as they're school appropriate, I think that would be fine. Um, you know, we, we all get a chance to show some, some of the kids we talk about, get a chance to show your personality with your socks. Well, yes, this year, maybe show your personality with your masks as well. Um, so as long as it's not a, something that's a big distraction or um, you're being irresponsible with the, the, the images that are on your mask, uh, I think I think we'll probably have some uh, leeway as far as your mask is concerned. Also, what will pickup look like for lower school students if they have a high school sibling? Okay. And I, I do agree with Mr. Harris on it, so I think that's a great way to handle the mask. Um, just do it above reproach, and if you're above reproach, then you're good with pretty much anything you decide to do. Um, we are going to ask that if you have lower school and upper school, um, it's going to be hard to begin the year, but we're going to need you to go to both spots because like fifth and sixth graders, we're going to run them over here. They're going to need to be picked up unless they're fifth and sixth grade uh, only. That's the only kid you have. They're going to go out the third and fourth grade hallway to be picked up there. But um, it'll take two or three days to figure out. You have to figure out. I would suggest you go through the lower school line first, pick up your lower school student. If you get here a little bit earlier and get towards the front of the line, then you come over here and get in the line at the upper school. You had a question that you showed me a minute ago. I forgot what it was. Uh, yes. How can parents donate um, any additional supplies like sanitizer? Well, thanks for that question. That's uh, to be honest with you, just donations this year will be a big deal and it's all going to go towards, you know, kind of the impact that COVID 19s had on the school and the different things that we've, um, going to need to do. Um, so if you'd like to, you can just give to the annual fund. You can do that online. Um, go to conwaychristianschool.org and then go to giving. And there's a link there for giving online. You always send in a check and you just put on their uh, annual fund COVID-19. Thank you for that. I appreciate it. Um, so athletics, um, how is that going to work with the time slot of 25 minutes? So with athletics, each coach is going to have their schedules. Um, it may it may look – it just depends on what season it is, what sport it is. They're not going to dress out and do 25 minutes of football, but there are – the way that they are butted up in the beginning and the end, the, the senior high teams will be able to come in before school and after school. Um, coach Kramer can better, you know, assist you with some of the what's going on with the schedules, and that will – your coaches will be able to uh, talk to you guys a little bit about that. But some teams will be having to come back later after school to practice. Uh, you can't really get everything done in – in 25 minutes, honestly, can't get everything done in 50 minutes athletically if you're doing it the right way. So um, it will there will be a challenge as far as athletics. This is more of an academic schedule than it is necessarily focusing on athletics or any other extracurriculars. Um, we are trying to give the best academic product we can. Um, and then we'll just give the other opportunities for us to do other things before and after school. This is for lower school PE. Uh, what will the lower school PE classes look like? And if kids can be spaced out, will masks be required? Okay. Um, let me, 
and we'll come right back to that. But let me on athletics while we're on it is we we'll get our directives whether we play seventh through twelfth grade athletics in what sports. Like right now, they're already preparing for golf to get started, for cross country to get started. We're still waiting here on football and on volleyball. That's going to come directly from the AAA once they hear from the governor's directives on how they want that to go down. So we'll communicate that with y'all and I'm sure it'll be on all the local news, wherever they decide to do. But um, as far as local, a lower school PE. Um, yes. So when they get over there and they get in the gym um, and obviously we're going to be utilizing outdoors quite a bit with PE as well. I, I, I envision, but they're going to be able to do that without their mask. I mean, they, there's strong guidelines there with the CDC and the AAP that, you know, you don't need to be working out or running around with a mask on. That's probably not very good for you. Okay. This one is for a lower school recess. My child will be going to recess with other kindergarten class or just her class as a family unit? Just your class as a family unit. There'll be a, there'll, we have a very small sixth grade class. That sixth grade, sorry, sixth grade. Um, that sixth grade will be able to do um, recess together and a couple other things. And we'll, we'll communicate that with our sixth grade parents. But every other class in the lower school, all the way through pre-K, will be doing all those things as a family unit. So regardless of what it is, you can just count on it being just with their class. So, um, this one is about exposure in the classroom. So if there is a concern, shall the other students be advised to stay home? And will all activities continue as planned? Yeah, we will communicate that to you. So if we feel like there's a situation where we need to take some precaution for a day or two or three, we will let you know that, hey, we're going to take this class to AMI for a few days, and then we will continue on with that learning um, with the classroom teacher doing the things I talked about earlier with the personalized instruction. But uh, that would be our approach. Okay. So this is for a uh, pickup in the afternoon for parents with lower school and pre-K students. Can we clarify how that's going to work? Yes, you you will need to help me on this, Don, if I'm right. But Judy, so if you if you'll need to sign your child out in the pre-K yes. by state law. Yes. So my my advice would be to. Um, go sign your child out in the pre-K if you're here before the 310 threshold. And then you could get in the carpool line with that child in there. If you want to wait till a little bit later so that you don't have to be in the midst of all the people, like come at like 320, 325, then, you know, we can have your kid ready there at the end. You can come around to the side, pick up your child through the pre-K entrance, which we described before. And then, um, come back around and then we can help get your child to the car. They can park in the line and then come in and get your kid and go back out. Yeah. Okay. Mr. Holt had a good point. So you could get in the line, park, just make sure you run in with plenty of time to get back out before the line starts, get your pre-K kid, get back in the car. And that way, that's the way to do it. That's the best way to do it. So just park, get there early enough that you can run in and get your pre-K kid. Any other questions? Okay. Before we get done and thank you all for joining us. This looks like we've got, 130, 140 families with us. I'm going to ask Dr. Thad Harden and Dr. John Mark Johnson to come up and just give their viewpoint because I think it's very applicable to what we're trying to do, and I do appreciate them. So, guys, if y'all want to come on up, I'm going to get out of the way so y'all can take your mask off. And if y'all have any questions for either of these doctors, feel free to shoot us uh, an email real quick. Take <clears throat> well, first of all, I want to say thank you, Jason. Thank you for the Board of Trustees. Thank you, Dr. Harden. We both uh, put in a lot of hours into this, researching and seeing what the latest of the CDC is, what are the latest things we can do for the school. And I think we've come up with an amazing plan that's established, and it's whether or not we can stick to it with the families uh, cooperating with us, as well as what Jason's going to be doing. A lot of our jurisdiction or what his going to be is not falling on his shoulders, but with the CDC and what's going to be specific to each case scenario. So turn that over to Thad, but thank you again, guys, for all the hard work you're putting into this. And I think it's a great school and a very safe environment to be in this year. So again, I would like to say thank you for everybody involved. Uh, certainly not an easy time to deal with, um, but I think in meeting with John Mark and uh, the board and the COVID committee, that we formulated about as good a plan as we could get. And we had our plan out prior to the CDC guidelines and pretty much, pretty much met all those guidelines ahead of time. Um, 
I think we looked at our children's safety above all else when we're coming up with these guidelines. And some of them may sound like, oh, my gosh, why are we doing that? That's so strict. Well, we can always loosen up later, but we need to start as as close to the guidelines as we can um, to keep your children safe. And I think Jason hit on it and John Mark hit on a little bit. But the biggest thing is the school can do what the school can do at the school. We're going to have to rely on each other to be responsible when we're outside of the school so that we limit the amount or the risk of students coming into the school as asymptomatic carriers, because all it takes is two or three people thinking, oh, it won't hurt if it's just me. And then we have to close down classes or worst case scenario, close down the school. So I would ask everybody to not only pray for each other, but to behave and act for each other so that we have each other's back because that's what make Con what makes Conway Christian so special in this small school is we're focusing on God and we're focusing on others. And if we can do those things, love God and love others, this school year will move forward and we will limit our risk as much as possible. And I think like Jason said, we can get in 178 days if we do uh, our best to keep up with these guidelines and to keep each other's, uh, best interests at heart. Thanks, guys. Perfect. Awesome. Appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, we're about to wrap up. Um, Randy, you know, am I putting you on the spot? Um, Randy Lewis, um, most people know him as uh, Judy Lewis is his better half. Yeah. Amen. But uh, Randy is our chairman of our board of trustees. Love this brother. He's been a valuable resource for me and for the board and for the school moving forward. I'm just going to ask you, you say whatever you want to say, but also if you'll just pray us out yeah. and then um, we'll uh, call the night. Thank everybody for joining us. Okay. Well, I just want to thank Jason. <clears throat> I want to thank all the other board members. Uh, and, and just so you know, uh, everyone up here has been working so hard from Jason to the administrators, to our, to our teachers, thankful for the doctors that are here tonight. Um, all of our, uh, just everyone in the Conley Christian family. And I love this. I love this theme. Let's, let's do this well together. We're excited. Uh, we feel like our size makes us uh, really flexible and we're able to do some things that um, larger schools aren't going to be able to do. So really thankful, excited about the school year. And uh, let's just pray together and close out tonight. Father, we're thankful tonight. We're thankful most of all to be uh, called your children, uh, sons and daughters of the living God. Uh, we're thankful for Jesus. Um, that makes uh, our relationship with you possible and for us to call you um, our dad. And so, Father, we, uh, we're thankful for the leadership of the school. I'm thankful for all of those that have poured a lot of time and effort uh, into this plan. I'm thankful for um, our families. And, Father, I love this thought that we can do this well together and love each other well. So, Father, we just ask for your blessing over this year. Um, Bless us as we as we proceed in this plan. Father, give us wisdom when we need to change directions and change things up. Um, Father, I'll, uh, help us to forgive each other well and to give each other some grace, uh, Father, because you've uh, demonstrated that grace to us. Uh, Father, bless us this year in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Have a good evening. Mm -hmm.